Call it my Olympic moment, trying something I've never tried before, a once in a lifetime shot of adrenaline. I was expecting a little bear hug on the way down. I didn't get one. But this is the routine, the reality, for just about every single one of Canada's Winter Olympians. Taking risks to reap rewards. Going faster, pushing harder, all too often tempting fate. Remember, it was just four years ago, as Canada's own Winter Games were set to open, when Georgian luger Nodar Kumaratashvili careened off a very fast track and was killed. Two years ago, it was Sarah Burke, the Canadian freestyle pioneer, who died after a training accident on the super pipe. And weeks later, Nick Zoracic, the Canadian ski cross racer, was dead after crashing hard at a World Cup. So, when it comes to testing the boundaries of sport, how far is too far? A Canadian winter, all snow and ice, downward slopes and slick surfaces. Think about it. Nothing drives the human body faster than a winter sport. Take alpine skiing, the original extreme sport. 1967, the first ever World Cup, and the legendary Jean-Claude Keeley won Austria's famed Hanakam race with an average speed of just over 87 kilometers per hour. In 1980, Canada's Ken Reed won it with an average speed of just over 92. These days, ever propelled by innovation, skiers are flying up to 150 kilometers per hour or more down sections of some courses. Now, that's got to be a thrill or something more daunting, perhaps? On that question, there may be no better source than one of Canada's best alpine racers, Jan Hudek. Yeah, good to see you. Let me start by getting a sense from you about how fast you're going when you're going down that hill. Uh, I mean, I can give you numbers. I mean, it ranges between 50, 60, 70, 80 k an hour to up to actually last year we hit a record at 160 in Vengen. And, you know, to the average person, they don't even drive that fast in their car. No. But at 160, it's it's literally uncomfortable. Well, how is it uncomfortable? Skiing is a dangerous sport, and no matter how confident you are, no matter how young and naive you are, there's always in the back of your mind, there's there's always the possibility of, of crashing. And I think the higher the speed is, the, I think the more you start thinking about it. And there it is, the risk. Although skiing very fast has earned Hudak big rewards, including trips to the top of the World Cup podium, there have been painful, career-threatening wipeouts too. Now that's got to take a toll. I'm often afraid. It's almost inevitable that a downhill ski racer will have a season-ending injury at some point in their career. But at the end of the day, all your ducks have to be in a row to even give yourself a chance to be on the podium. And, and fear is a huge part of it. It's not ignoring it, but it's, you know, embracing it in a way that you can translate into adrenaline. Because I guess that's what we'll never understand, is, is that acceptance of the fear factor, but you're, at the same time, you're pushing yourself to go faster. It is, and that's, and that's actually been one of my personal challenges over the years. I've had seven knee surgeries. Each time I came back, it was more difficult to overcome that fear, to, to mentally really almost trick myself into, you almost have to trick yourself first to start believing again that you're safe or that you're okay. Not just okay, but ready to push the limits again and again. And that holds true for just about every winter sport. Consider speed skating where record breakers average 50 kilometers per hour. Elite snowboarders can approach 60, and the sliding events on the straightaways, an athlete head first on a skeleton can double that speed, easy. 
My fastest is 141 kilometers an hour. Mine is 142.7, so I guess I've edged Eric out a little bit. <laughs> uh, but every track in the world is a little different. So here in Calgary, you do just over 120. Eric Nielsen and John Fairburn are part of Canada's Olympic skeleton squad, hungry for gold, willing to take it to the brink. Well, I've pushed the envelope a little bit too far a few times, so I've had a couple crashes, some pretty beautiful looking <laughs> crashes, but uh, I, there's always a fine line. And for me, like I, I want to push it as close to that line as I can. And I feel like that for me is the best way to go fast is to push it. Um, to that limit where you know you feel like okay I'm a little bit out of control but I can I can manage it. Out of control? Really? We want to go fast. We're the athletes we want to try and push those boundaries. But at the end of the day we want to go home to our families and and uh, and life beyond sport too so uh, yeah it's all about that balance. Balance. Finding the threshold between fast and too dangerous. And as audiences the world over get set to tune in, delivering the drama of sport without going over the edge. Which is why I came here. Tell me something about what is going to be happening. To Calgary's one-time Olympic bobsled course, still home to World Cups and Olympic bobsledders in training. Perfect. Elite athletes you'll see in Sochi, like Chris Spring, Jesse Lumsden, and Heather Moyes. There's no turning back. My teachers in this lesson on limits. And it's about as authentic as you can get. Exhilarating. Sobering. Everything you said is exactly true. You have no sense of the speed you're going to encounter when no. you've never done this before. No, no, we don't. I mean, it is so fast. Certainly unlike anything I've experienced before. And I've been in F-18s, you know, yeah. fighters and stuff. It's, it's got those beat. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And how would you describe it to somebody else who's never done yeah. it? Um, well, I think that it's the speed, it's the up and down. Violent up and then and down. Is there a rush every time? Every time. There is, every time. Yeah. Every single time. Every time we cross through the finish line, there is a, an absolute rush. So at our fastest speed, how far, how fast would we have been going at the fastest moment? Probably 125 kilometers yeah, an hour. I'd say so. How much control have you got over the machine at that kind of speed? I have uh, a lot of control under pressure. So when we're in a corner and we're experiencing those G-forces that you right. felt, then I have quite a lot of control and I can put the sled where I want it to go. Right. Um, but definitely on it, if you're going down a straightaway where there's zero pressure, downward pressure on the sled, then it's very difficult to move the sled on the straightaway without it breaking into a skid. So whatever you get coming out of a corner is what you get going into the next one. Um, you had a bad crash. I did, yeah. What do you remember about it? I remember everything actually. Uh, the sounds, the smells, the, uh, the voices, the guys moaning in the background, visions. I, I remember it all. So I, I see it every day, um, whether I'm on the track or off the track. Photos of the crash aftermath are startling. It was January 2012. Spring was piloting a four-man sled at a World Cup in Germany, when in the final corners, disaster. The track and bobsled were left a shattered mess, and Spring in hospital for eight days. And what is the impact of having gone through that experience? What do, how does it change the way you race? Uh you know what, I gave Bobsleigh a lot of respect before I crashed, well, this particular crash, and I give it the same amount of respect afterwards. And it's just a constant reminder that this sport is, is dangerous and, uh, and the bad things can happen. So it keeps me sharp and it's, it's, I feel like it's my little aid to, uh, to help me be a better driver now. So it, I'm using it as a positive instead of a negative and, oh, and it's been working correct. since. Brakeman Heather Moyes has had her share of challenges since becoming Olympic champion in 2010, pushing limits that come with time, not just speed. You can see you've actually injured this a lot. At 35, she's almost a decade older than the average female Winter Olympian. Injuries and surgery meant she could barely walk last bobsled season, let alone dream of repeating gold in Sochi. But as these Olympics approached, Moist was back. Disciplined training, 
and therapy, making her stronger than ever. I really surprised myself that I pushed in the ice house. I pushed the fastest time that I've ever pushed in the air, ever. Heather, you had to really push your body to get back mm -hmm. ready for this. And, you know, we're all getting older. <laughs> so you're, you're, you're always pushing your body. Yes, it's always had to be this challenge that I have to prove to myself that can I do it? Like, can I do what people think is impossible? I'm coming back to a sport where I know that I would be able to come back to being somewhat athletic, but to come back to a sport where we're talking about hundredths of a second, you just have no idea. It's, a, it's an invasive hip surgery, and so it was kind of like, well, we'll see. We'll see what I can do. And what Olympians can do, how far they can take the training, has become dependent on equipment, technology too. Simple example, the skate. The boot of a standard figure skate is about 30% lighter than it was 20 years ago, meaning less fatigue for the skater and bigger jumps. And clap skates, standard for long track speed skaters now, but when they first really caught on at the Nagano Olympics, a slew of records was broken. Then there's all that slick sportswear. Refining happens constantly. In fact, just weeks ago, wind tunnel tests determined the most aerodynamic combination of fabrics for Canada's speed skating team. Less drag on those suits, faster skaters in Sochi. I think we, we have been able to make a difference, specifically in, in bringing athletes that maybe would be, uh, helping athletes would be like top 10 and bringing up to the podium. The National Research Council's Guy LaRose has been working with Olympians since before the Turin Games, using science to make them speedier. But for him, there is a limit. I would think that the athletes could actually at some point refuse to go in a, in a run because it looks too dangerous. It could happen. Like Bobby Miller actually said, like, this is not a circus. We're not here to kill ourselves. We're here to compete. The athletes will realize that maybe when I choose my equipment, I will choose an equipment maybe that is not the faster, but at least it's the safest. When we come back, how Sochi could put the brakes on speed. Companies and nations will do whatever it takes to win at the end of the day. In the past, helmets were actually... In a corner of Jan Hudek's living room, you see evidence of rewards, but these days you also see evidence of mitigating risk. Recent rule changes in Alpine have meant skiers can wear protection under their suits, for their backs, their legs, and something else is coming. Hudek has been among a select group testing a new airbag system that fits under the suit and would inflate behind the neck. Will they have these for Sochi or no? I know they're pushing really hard and they wanted to have it ready for Sochi, um, but uh, I know we're close and it's, it's definitely a step in the right direction because, you know, neck injuries, head injuries and things like that are, are rampant. In terms of the, the push for, for speed, you know, what's too far? I'm not sure where that line is. That's the problem. I think it's, I think the line might be too great. Hudek points to the dilemma, for example with skis, how for years a technically faster ski wasn't necessarily better. So what happened was when we had those, you know, shorter skis that could make a shorter, tighter radius on ice, you know, guys started getting injured. Basically the skis were too good, the technology was too good for the human body to really handle properly. So now we're actually, we've regressed and now we're back on a longer ski, skinnier ski. It's harder to turn, it's harder to navigate. The speed is still as fast on the straightaways and, and some of the other turns, but same thing. Companies and nations will do whatever it takes to win at the end of the day. But when you say whatever it takes, yeah, I mean, you're the guys in the middle. It's your life at stake. That's true, but there's a paycheck at that finish line. Yeah. If you it's, make it's, it. It's, if you make it. And I think it's, it's such a complex subject. I mean, no one wants slow skis at the end of the day because money's on the line. And it's, and it's a lot of, and it's not just money, but I think, you prestige. know, prestige, the win. Dion Hudet said he's done it. You got one more in you? Definitely.
In Skeleton, there's gold at stake, too, in steel. Eric Nielsen and John Fairburn know it's the chemical makeup of the steel sled and the grooves on the steel runners that can make all the difference in speed, control, and ultimately, victory. Of course, there's pilot skill as well. Likely never more so than in Sochi. Sochi's a really unique track in the world. It's got a couple uphill sections uh, that most of the tracks don't have. Those uphill sections, a safety consideration after 2010's tragedy in the Luge. I think they were put in there just to slow it down a little bit because I think if they would have kept it downhill, we'd be, we'd be going pretty fast. <laughs> pretty fast. That really is, though, how bobsledders Chris Spring, Jesse Lumsden, and Heather Moyes want to be going in the days ahead hurtling down the Sochi track, navigating the risks, aiming for the biggest rewards. Thanks to these Olympians, I get it. Well, sort of. I had no con. I knew it was going to be fast, but no concept of it. Was going to be I think like people, that. they suddenly are just astounded by, oh my gosh, it's so steep, and the corners are not just corners, they're like straight up walls where you're going sideways. And it took me years until I could get down this track without clanging and banging down the walls. As a driver, we're always striving for that perfect run, and let me tell you, out of the 100, or about, about 1,020 runs that I've done in my career, I've not once got to the bottom and been absolutely 100% satisfied with my run. So. February. Fe February, I'm going to put down eight solid runs and walk away a happy man. Listen, good luck. Thank Thanks you. very much. I'm sure it'll be great. Yeah, Just great remember all the things I taught you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's, scream, a pleasure. scream Thank you loud on the way down the track. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.